Hey, everyone. Pull up the lecture. All right. So we are going to just pick up where we left off. Uh, exa I mean, exactly where we left off last time. We'll just begin with Wednesday's checkpoint slide and just start plowing forward not faster and faster, but farther and farther, where we'll cover more and more information. And, and so try to, if you can rewatch uh, the lectures between each one, you won't feel too far behind. If you get to the end of mTOR, like, okay, now I'm gonna start studying, the accumulated vocabulary is going to ruin your day. And so if you can try to learn a lot of those key terms, and the major points and, and physiological interactions as we go. When we get to the end and I start doing some summarizing commentary, it will summarize things that, that are coherent. It will summarize things that make sense to you and a lot of clicking, will, will, you'll, like the audible clicking in, in your head. But if, it's, if you don't rewatch and and try to learn all of the material as we go it's just gonna feel like a giant mess and it's uh, it'll be an unpleasant place to be if you don't uh, try to keep up along the way so we're gonna start here I have the chat box open if you have questions along the way the chat box is is ready for those questions but what is mTOR well mammalian target of rapamycin uh, you know it's a it's a kinase the mTOR enzyme is a kinase but they exist in complexes there's mTOR complex one you see raptor regulatory associated protein of tor raptor that's only in complex one richter uh, rapamycin insensitive ri richter's companion of, of TOR. Uh, that's only in complex two. So Richter is a complex two protein. Raptor is complex one. And we'll start getting into some of those differences of complex one, complex two today. But complex one is what we're going to focus on. So that's mTOR. And the mTOR complex means there's a bunch of proteins that travel together in a complex. So if you think about like Oh, uh, a family, you know, there's, there's a, like a husband and a wife, there's a, a daughter and a son and, and a dog and a goldfish and whatever. You have this family, they're all in the same household. They're sort of a functional unit. The family, they all live together. They travel together. They're a functional unit, but nobody would argue that the dog and the dad are the same person. Right? These there are different proteins that sort of live in the same household. That's what it means by these, these mTOR complexes. You have a bunch of these proteins all in the same household. But mTOR, or this is what we name it after. This is the kinase. Remember, kinase phosphorylate stuff. This is the kinase that does the phosphorylation of anabolic signaling. A, a, a lot of anabolic signaling. And we did in the last lecture and the lectures that came before, we've taken a very plump look at signaling cascades, you know, a bunch of PKA stuff and, and what signaling cascades, what cell signaling looks like. Well, we took a slender look at anabolic signaling, right? This very slim look at mTOR. And so today we're going to do a little bit of mTOR buffet, right? We're, we're going we're gonna to indulge in mTOR signaling and go through all of the major players upstream and downstream from mTOR, from that enzyme, look at anabolic signaling. Uh, so how does mTOR signaling work? It's phosphorylation cascades, right? A bunch of kinases, you know, PI3 kinase, protein kinase B, and mTOR is a kinase. I mean, you just go through P70S6K kinase and, and all this, this series of kinases. Um, you know, the, even the MAPK, mitogen activated protein kinase, we'll talk about that, the ERK, MAPK uh, signaling, we'll talk about those. Uh, RSK kinase, we'll talk about that. A lot of kinases. Remember, kinase is an enzyme. It's a protein. Enzymes are proteins. It's a protein, an enzyme that attaches phosphates 
to things. Um, a phosphatase is going to take these phosphates off uh, of these of these things. So like PI3 kinase, PI3K, is going to convert PIP2 to PIP3. Uh, phosphatidyl nozitol triphosphate, PIP3. P10, which is phosphatase and tensin homolog, P10 is, uh, this is going to take it off. It does the exact same thing as exact opposite thing of PI3K. And so that's a phosphatase. A phosphatase takes the phosphate off. A kinase attaches a phosphate. So how does mTOR signaling work? This is phosphorylation cascades, right? Let's throw some phosphates on things. Let's, let's attach phosphates to other you know, enzymes and proteins and, and change their behavior, phosphorylation cascades. That's really what mTOR is doing. And what does mTOR signaling accomplish? It, it depends on mTOR signaling one, complex one versus complex two. There's a little bit of a difference. Complex two, we will talk about very briefly. So I'll say that one first and sort of get it out of the way. It'll come up again in this lecture, but we'll get out of the way. Very comprehensive metabolic signaling, sort of the breadth of metabolism, complex two, a bunch of survival stuff. It's glucose uptake, tons of ion transport and cell volume control, uh, epithelial interactions. There's heart stuff. There's liver stuff, liver and, and cardiac function, actin, cytoskeleton. Um, Lots of the, the breadth of metabolic functioning, survival, stuff like that, complex two. Complex one, what is it doing? Grow, 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 grow. Divide, grow, 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 grow. That's complex one. And it's much better understood than complex two. Way more research on complex one than complex two. The interactions with complex two are easier uh, to do. Uh, you know, it's more sensitive to, to inhibition and and Complex one is actually downstream from complex two. One of the things complex two does is, is activate PKB. And what does PKB do? Well, it's upstream from complex one, right? So downstream from PKB, we are inhibiting tubrin. And tubrin was inhibiting REB. And, and now REB is turned on. So, so or at least, you know, preserves its GTP. So combined, I'll talk about exactly what REB is doing. But it's complex two does a bunch of stuff. You don't really need to know it for the test, right? This is muscle physiology as a course. And so what we're going to talk about is complex one, which is really this core regulator of muscle metabolism, of protein turnover, of muscle metabolism, complex one, this core regulator of that. So what is the foundation of muscle physiology? Well, you could say specificity of adaptation. You could say Henneman size principle in terms of its general function, neuro, neuromuscular function. And then you could say for the metabolism piece, mTOR. Now you could call it, you know, PKB signaling or whatever, but but there's other mechanisms of hypertrophy of interactions with mTOR than just PKB. And so mTOR is this critical regulator of skeletal muscle metabolism, anabolic cell growth and proliferation. Now it's all over the place. It's in the brain too, right? So uh, dendrite formation. Um, proliferation, differentiation, this stuff, it's, it's all over the place, but, but skeletal muscle, that's what we're going to be talking about. And mTOR complex one, you see um, growth. If you, wanna, if you want to adapt, you want to grow and adapt and hypertrophy in a weight room or on, a, on an athletic field or whatever, with some sort of training, you elicit adaptation. mTOR complex one is, is critical. And if you understand how it works, you can interact with it. And if you can interact with it, you can accelerate, you know, permit and accelerate uh, growth. You know, the response to exercise. People, you know, I used to work at a Bond Fitness Center, the, the campus weight room. And, and it's funny because I'd see people go in, they're freshmen, and then they leave as seniors and they haven't changed. 
you know, they, they wear their little tank tops and, and they look the exact same from the time they arrive to four years later, they graduate, they sort of matriculate and graduate and the time in between nothing happens. But boy, do I see them in the weight room a lot. And there's, there's a way of, of improving, right? So there's, there's a way of, of encouraging those responses. Is there a genetic difference from person to person? Sure, yeah, there's a genetic difference. Some people have a better starting point. Some people grow better, but everyone can do it. Just like in education, you know, some people have a have a, a different starting point, but everyone can can make progress. And often, the people who start farthest in the lead don't end up in the lead because they're denied the uh, the encouragement, that necessity, that that sort of urgency. And and you know, there was there. I've mentioned this before. There was a student here when I was a student. His name was Marcel Gibson. And like, he didn't even work out and he could bench press over 400 pounds and he like didn't even exercise. I mean, it's like Andre the Giant and Princess Bride. I don't even exercise, you know, it's that thing. And I watched him do 405 cold and like, he's just like not even an exerciser. But that guy, if he had motivation, I mean, that guy could have been, I mean, he'd make Ronnie Coleman look like, you know, a dwarf. And, but he just, he didn't have the motivation. A lot of people sort of start in the middle of the pack and they end up, it's that hungry wolf cliche, and and so how do you make progress if you if you have an appetite? How do you you know find satiety? How do you sate that appetite? Uh, so I'm just reading the comments. Uh, I am guilty of not training hard enough. Uh, so yeah, there's there's a lot of this. There's, there's a train hard component. We'll 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 talk about what all this stuff actually look uh, looks like, but it's it's a matter of regulation. So you know the the election is over, whatever Biden won. But but the, the the we're in sort of election season, and a lot of my analogies. It's just we make analogies based on what's on our minds at the moment. So think of your cells, your tissues, your organs, your cells, your meat. Think of this stuff. It's just like it's like governments and it's checks and balances, and you have to, you, you, you detect wealth to spend wealth, right? You tax and you spend and you can't spend way more than you tax, right? There's going to be a bank. Just you're balancing your own paycheck, balancing your own pay, uh, budgets. If you keep spending money and spending money, spending ATP, spending ATP, if you're a cell, you're going to go bankrupt, Right. Yeah, but if you also just accumulate and accumulate and accumulate, that's bad in the body. It's sort of okay for for your bank account. That's fine, but but you want to balance. You want to balance a a budget. There's a lot of comments. I I, I don't want to get too too caught up in in the comments because then I'll never make progress in the lecture. Although I like the commentary, I'm enjoying seeing the commentary, but I, I do want to you kind know, of keep our march going forward. And at the end of lecture, I'll, I'll try to address as much as I can. But this just, again, we're balancing budgets and function. I mean, for our, for, hum, for humanity, for biology, survival is impossible without regulation, but certainly function is impossible without metabolic regulation. And mTOR is so tightly regulated. It looks like a mess. It looks like a sloppy mess, but it is so well regulated. Uh, but this is just a nice article. You know, it's talking about MLST8 or GABLE, um, G protein beta subunit like G beta L GABLE, same name or same different name for the same thing. MLST8, GABLE, they're the exact same thing. Um, but so that's what this article is about. But really what this passage is about is, is a nice characterization of mTOR complex one versus mTOR complex two. So the differences between these things, two large protein complexes, complex one, right? If you see mTOR C1, that just means complex one. And mTOR complex two, mTOR C2. And they're independently regulated by different things. There are different regulatory upstream, you know, um, variables, uh, upstream components that are that are going to regulate these things. And complex one has Raptor and Pras40, and complex two has Richter and M sign one and Proter. We'll talk about what these things are, and they're not as important. Now, Raptor, super important, 
super important. This one isn't that important. We'll talk about Deptor uh, more than that one. Um, but M the mTOR enzyme, super important. Uh, Richter, as long as you know what it is, these things aren't as, as, as important. But looking at these, at the diverse upstream and downstream, the downstream targets and the upstream activators and inhibitors, that's what, uh, that's the important stuff is that they're differently controlled and they activate different things. But remember mTOR complex two, the one with a Richter, this is activating um, PKB, AKT or PKB, that's activating that one. And this is activating complex one. So downstream from complex two is complex one. Complex one is activated by complex two, but you can't rely on complex two to do all of your complex one activation. Otherwise you'd be tiny. <laughs> you, would, you would just favor catabolism to such a degree that it would be like a lethal, right? So you, you, need, you need more sources of mTOR complex one activation than simply mTOR complex two. There's just a little bit there, but this is a nice passage describing the differences between mTOR complex one and complex two. And we'll, we'll get into mostly complex one, but a couple more slides, I'll talk about these major differences. So Raptor, right? Regulatory associated protein of TOR, of target of rapamycin, RAP, TOR, right, target of rapamycin, mTOR, mammalian target of rapamycin. In one of the earlier lectures, I don't know, it was the last one or something, I, I talked about the, the nomenclature of mTOR. And this guy, Robert Abraham, you don't need to know any of these names, but this guy, Robert Abraham, named it mTOR. And it was the best of the three names. And, but rapamycin was, was sort of in the names of, of all of these things. Um, so mammalian target of rapamycin. Later, people started doing mechanistic target of rapamycin. I just think that's dumb. Like, don't do that. I'll just, I'll, it doesn't matter. I just, I'll roll my eyes. It's, it's just a, who, why, mechanistic, what are you talking about? Um, but you the other names that you might encounter, um, Raft1, Raft1 was um, David Sabatini, my favorite researcher in, in, in mTOR. And, um, Stuart Schreiber was FRAP, F-R-A-P. So you're gonna encounter some other names, but almost all literature, I mean, nearly 100%, they call it mTOR. That was the best of the names, but- uh, Professor Jensen, sorry to yes. ask you, could you repeat that really quick, the, what your professor said? Did you say RAG, RAG1? I just wanted to write that down really quickly, because I watched- Oh, we'll talk about RAG. Yeah, we'll talk about that. that that's not what oh. I said, that's not what I said in this- Okay, so, uh, so I was kind of like, wait a second. That's why, because I, I was watching a video for, on mTOR yesterday, and I just, like well, really yeah, we'll talk about the RAG. Um, so, so that's for that's for nutrient sensitivity, um, amino acids, um, RAG, GTPases. That's that's for nutrient sensing from the amino acid side of things. So, nutrient sensing on the carbohydrate side of things, you're looking at at sugar, you know, insulin, and uh, insulin binding to its receptor and PI3K, PKB, and and that signaling cascade, RAG. Um, that's that we're looking at protein sensing, um, you know, amino acid sensing. And I promise we'll get there. We're not going to get there today. Uh, maybe we'll get there Monday. Definitely by Wednesday, we'll get we'll get to rack. But um, like raft, um, so raft one and frap, f r a p. Those are alternative names for mTOR, right? For the for the actual mTOR uh, enzyme, and they both include. Um, FKBP12, I'll show you what that is in just a second. So Sabatini's, again, he's my favorite researcher I, I, who I suggest you watch if you wanna see some videos, um, if you find something by him. But um, rapamycin and FKBP12 target one, R-A-F-T. Rapamycin and FKBP12 target one, RAFT one. and um, Stuart Schreiber's FRAP, um, there's, there's an FKBP12 in there as well. And th this is the, where rapamycin interacts with the mTOR complex. Remember the family analogy of, of that, that image of, of we have a family, we have mommy and daddy and, and the you know, sons and daughters and pets and whatever. And, and you have a similar household of a complex and in it, Right, you have if it's complex one, um, you're going to have 
uh, Gable, right? MLSD8 or Gable. Um, Raptor is in there and the mTOR enzyme and, and you'll see Deptor and Pras40 and some other uh, complex proteins in the complex too. But sort of the critical hub, the three that are always considered, this is mom, dad, and child, right, are, are, are those three. And again, we're not really paying too much attention to these ones. We'll talk about them. And I want you to know that, that there's a difference. And, but you don't really need to know much about this. This is what I want you to know a lot about. And it's the one we'll focus on partly because it's the best understood, partly because it's the most uh, relevant to a muscle physiology class, right? The critical regulator of skeletal muscle metabolism is this one. And so it really trying to keep current as we go along of, of, it sounds like Jacob, I, th I think that was you who chimed in, uh, uh, watching the, the YouTube videos, that's helpful as long as you pick good ones. Um, that's really helpful. If you listen to these lectures again, um, there are plenty of good articles. Uh, so if, if you try to stay uh, up to speed with my pacing, you're gonna do great on this third exam. But the reason the third exam is the hardest one is like you, you're seeing how much material there is, how much information. Uh, we sort of take a little bit of time on hormones and walk through all them and then we roar through enzymes and then here's mTOR with like a thousand new words. And, and so the amount of material in this block can be overwhelming if you don't, if you don't pace the marathon right. Um, if you're like, you know what, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna rest here at the starting line until there's 10 minutes to go. And then I'm gonna try to do the marathon. Like, hey, you'll never cross the finish line and your grade will reflect that. So make sure you stay current with mTOR and mostly complex one. Leave complex two until the last day, fine, right? Stay current with complex one. And that's what we're going to spend most of our time on. Now, think baseball. If you want to do like home run derby, you got three critical fielders, right? You got a catcher, you got a pitcher, and you got a center fielder. Okay, so you have your kinase here, right? Your 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 pitcher, your your the baseball in this case would be the phosphate, and your your phosphorylating stuff, and whatever downstream targets you'd be phosphorylating. But but the critical, if you're gonna have some sort of like you're playing baseball and you're down to three players, you need a pitcher, a catcher, and a center fielder some sort of let's stand in the middle of, of everything and try to try to field whatever that is mTOR raptor mlst8 but again I, I i talked about this as the importance of regulation the importance of regulation in maintaining muscle metabolism growth and decay hypertrophy and atrophy synthesis and degradation however you want to call it the balance of this is so critical to your survival and so there's all these additional players on the field. If you want to play the game for real, all right, now we have a batter at the plate and we have a first baseman who's like suspiciously close to the batter and, and I, I, they're expecting a bunt or something. And so you have all of these, these additional players and that's, we have 10 right here. We have 10 over here, right? So we have our, our batter and our nine fielders. Okay, let's go one by one through this list of 10. We've talked about some of this stuff already. We've introduced what mTOR is, this kinase. It's an enzyme, a phosphorylating enzyme. And we've talked about Raptor a little bit. We've briefly mentioned MLST8. We talked about tubrin and Reb, right? Tubrin is upstream from, from the mTOR enzyme and it's actually inhibiting Reb, which is the thing that activates mTOR. We've, we've mentioned these, right? 4-EBP1 and P70-S6K. These are the downstream targets of mTOR, what mTOR is phosphorylating, what mTOR attaches its phosphate to, what that kinase phosphorylates. Um, this thing would be inhibiting protein translation. This thing would be promoting it. And this is a kinase itself. See that little K? It's a kinase. Kinase means you attach a, phos a phosphate to something, you phosphorylate something. What is it phosphorylating? Ribosomal protein S6. Where do you think that's having its effect, right? The ribosome, ribosomal protein. What does a ribosome do? Translation. Uh, protein synthesis linked together amino acids. And then these two things are inhibitory. And Deptor is a fascinating one. Press 40 is less fascinating. At least to my knowledge, it's less fascinating. And maybe 
future roles with with that one will be um, elucidated in the future. Like, oh, this is super interesting. But right now, Deptor actually is kind of fascinating. But these are negative regulators of mTOR and generally listed in this complex up here. But we'll just go uh, one by one. But remembering that in anything, you need regulation tons of umpires and referees and and you need judges and you need proctors and to, to have anything be like if you don't have umpires in baseball uh, everyone's just gonna cheat right how do you know that was a strike no it was i mean just watch like street ball foul oh i didn't touch you uh, like what but i'm bloody I, I i'm missing a finger now and it's like squirting blood here you have and we need referees and, and umpires and mtor has a ton so i mean there's like a thousand referees who are who are kind of referring everything and refereeing everything and uh, we'll talk about those but that's not really this stuff now tuberous sclerosis complex sure that's a pretty big um, referee. It's 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 uh, with withholding um, Reb's activation and and um, we'll 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 get to that one. But it's it's if you have a mutation in the tuberous sclerosis complex, you get a condition known as tuberous sclerosis, right? And so that is this out of control growth of benign tumors. So that's where we're starting to see a lot of regulation where you get a mutation, one of these things and out of control growth. Um, so very tightly regulated, but starting with the mTOR complex, here you see Gable, G beta L, G protein beta subunit like, uh, Gable or MLST8, that's the same thing. And then you see Raptor, and you see mTOR, you see rapamycin. It's not rapamycin, like it's like actin and myosin. It's rapam rapamycin, and that's an inhibitor. And cell growth is the consequence. Cell growth and proliferation, right? So you grow, 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 divide. Grow, 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 divide. Grow, grow, grow. But but mTOR is just let's just grow. Let's just let's start. Uh, linking together amino acids. Let's start synthesizing proteins. Let's let's get this cell uh, bulky. Let's let's start growing. And so those three core proteins you see right here: Gable, Raptor, and mTOR. mTOR, Raptor, and Gable. MLST8 or Gable. Uh, those three. Now rapamycin. What it's actually interacting with is FKBP12. I'll show you what that looks like in just a minute. But protein synthesis is downstream from mTOR activity. Okay, here's a complex, a protein complex, a bunch of shit there. A lot of a lot of proteins, separate proteins. You see Raptor in the green over there on the right. You see Gable up top, the little orange guy, little Gable up there. You see mTOR, that big blue um, leaderly hub, sort of big daddy mTOR in the center. And over here, you see rapamycin and FKBP12. Right, rapamycin, this is exogenous. This isn't inside of you. Rapamycin is exogenous. It's a big carbon compound. You can see all these carbons, right? It's a big carbon compound and it's produced by bacteria. Uh, this, this isn't like, it's not like you have some gland that's kicking this thing out. We'll talk about Easter Island discovery and you know, produced by bacteria. But this thing interacts with mTOR at FKBP12. And so that's why that's important. And that's why when you start saying FRAP, remember I said FRAP, there's a RAFT1, R-A-F-T-1. That's the David Sabatini name. Um, F-R-A-P is the Stuart Schreiber name, but that's FKBP12 rapamycin associated protein, FRAP. That's mTOR, right? They're just talking about mTOR. And 2002, you know, fast forward the world after 2002, and, and nobody's really calling this stuff FRAP and RAF1, so we're just saying mTOR. And, but it's, so when you encounter some early literature, it doesn't mean early literature is bad. A lot of the, the foundational landmark, the critical literature that's, that's identifying these interactions and pathways is, is, it's not rudimentary at all. It's just, 
It's just, um, you know, they didn't have everything outlined yet. You know, we'll talk about like ribosomal protein um, S6 and how that thing, people were looking at that thing uh, before they were looking at, at a lot of this mTOR signaling. And, and so we, people were identifying specific steps in a lot of this stuff before they had the whole cascade worked out. But um, so if you see FRAP or RAFT1, um, RAF to one with an F, RAP with an F in it, FKBP12, that's what they're referencing. And that's where rapamycin, um, this big carbon compound, that's where it interacts is FKBP12. Now, Raptor, definitely remember pretty much everything I say about Raptor. Raptor, super important, critical. Um, lose this and see you later, right? Raptor, so important. Now, uh, its primary function, people are still identifying the effects of Raptor, the, the uh, interactions that it has, the permissions that it grants, the roles that it plays. People are still figuring out how Raptor uh, works. But what seems to be its primary function is recruiting the downstream targets, the substrates for mTOR, for mTOR uh, complex one. You know, mTOR is a kinase, it phosphorylates stuff. And a kinase can't just like, you know what, I'm just going to cold call and hope I receive, I hope somebody picks up that I need. That doesn't work. Or you just, you know, shoot your gun into the abyss and hope it hits its target. That's, you're not a sharpshooter, right? You're not going to hit your target. You have to, you have to be a headhunter. You have to have a recruiter. And that's what uh, Raptor is doing. Raptor is recruiting, it's headhunting, it's recruiting the downstream targets for mTOR. So it, so it can actually phosphorylate them. Without Raptor's help, good luck phosphorylating those downstream targets. Raptor, you're, or, uh, uh, mTOR, you're useless. You need Raptor there. And so that's really the function of Raptor. Now it's very abundant in skeletal muscle. Raptor, very abundant in skeletal muscle. It exists elsewhere. Raptor exists all over the place, right? It's in your brain, it's in your guts, it's all over the place. Um, but it's, it's present elsewhere and very abundant in skeletal muscle. And if it helps you remember, right, Raptor, I, I just think Jurassic Park, although Jurassic Park is sort of silly, you know, this, this little guy in the middle right here, <laughs> that's your Velociraptor, this little like uh, barely threatening, um, like a hen size, like a, a Thanksgiving is coming up. Let's call it a turkey. We have a turkey-sized Cretaceous uh, dinosaur that was somehow recast in Jurassic Park as this menacing, terrible genius. <laughs> but it's like a little, like it's like a turkey. Um, that's your actual Velociraptor in real life. But um, with with Raptor major point of interaction. You know, I talk about crosstalk with mTOR, different things, you know, different proteins and, and cell signaling cascades are interacting with mTOR signaling. They're crosstalking with mTOR signaling. A major point of interaction is Raptor. Huge point of communication is with Raptor and tuberin too. Tuberous sclerosis complex, TSC2 is tuberin. That's another point of interaction, but Raptor, huge point of interaction. And it can be phosphorylated on a ton of sites. Raptor can be phosphorylated on multiple sites. It's not like it just has one light switch. Oh, here's the place where we phosphorylate it and it's on or it's off. Um, multiple phosphorylation sites. So sometimes I'll say phosphorylate Raptor and turn it on. Other times, I will say phosphorylate Raptor and turn it off. It depends where you're phosphorylating it. Now you don't need to know any of those phosphorylation sites. Yeah, I'll throw some of these up in the slides. I don't know, I don't have those memorized. You don't have to have them memorized. If there's something I don't have memorized, I have to look up. I'm not gonna hold you accountable for that. So um, I'm not gonna hold you accountable for, for you know, exactly where you're phosphorylating Raptor. What I'm gonna hold you accountable for is that it gets phosphorylated and whether it turns on 
whether it turns off. And all you really need to know is like take MAPK and AMPK. These sound really similar. Right? Memorize them now, because if I start saying MAPK and AMPK a lot, you're like, oh, which is which? It's you're going to get confused and, and you're going to fall behind on, on mTOR signaling, on anabolic signaling. MAPK, super anabolic. Okay, MAPK, mitogen activated protein kinase. Now you don't need to recreate these names. You, you can just recognize it as MAPK, that's fine. MAPK, mitogen activated protein kinase, begin with an M, super anabolic. AMPK, all you do is switch the M and the A, right? AMPK, adenosine monophosphate activated protein kinase. AMPK, super catabolic. So MAPK, you're going to grow like the Dickens. Um, AMPK, you are going to waste away like you have quashia core, right? Like a protein deficiency disease. Uh, like the Dickens with quashia core. And so get to know these now. But what are these phosphorylating? Well, they interact with tuberin too, but Raptor, right? MAPK, phosphorylate Raptor, get this thing on. Anabolic, anabolic, anabolic. AMPK, phosphorylate raptor, turn this thing off. Catabolic, catabolic, catabolic. So getting to know raptor well and its diverse interactions is going to be critical for understanding mTOR and how it works. So multiple phosphorylation sites. Now, REB promotes um, ROS homolog enriched in brain, REB. This is a thing, REB, GTP. This is a thing that directly activates mTOR. So it's promoting Raptor in a, in a positive way. But really think of REB as, as the thing that it's this GTP binding protein. It's the thing that turns on mTOR gets mTOR to do its phosphorylating REB. That's what that is. And we'll get there. We're going to go through all of this today. We'll get there. Um, so again, AMPK phosphorylates Raptor in a couple of places in an inhibitory way. Here's our Raptor turkey. Um, it inhibits uh, Raptor. AMPK does. MAPK promotes it. So RSK, um, ribosomal protein S6 kinase ribosomal protein, R, S6 kinase, SK. Um, this thing, there are four isoforms of this thing. You don't need to know that. One, two, three, and four, they're very nicely named. It's not like named after people. Um, has a lot of effects, right? But this is, an, uh, so when you see ERK, Again, you don't need to, a lot of this, I'm, I'm doing more detail out of my mouth than I need you to know in your ears, but extracellular signal regulated kinase, you know, these kinases, this is the MAPK cascade over here. And you see RSK um, is downstream from that. It's in, it's sort of this tail end of the MAPK signaling. So ERK, MAPK, go ahead and, and lump those together. And you see RSK, and we are inhibiting tuberin. You know, tuberin is, is inhibiting REB, which turns on mTOR. So here we see this tuberous sclerosis complex inhibiting REB. It's actually you, you, really what it's doing, and I'll show you this in a minute, but REB has GTP and it needs to be GTP bound to turn on mTOR and, and we're facilitating this this hydrolysis of the GTP. That's really what this is doing as a negative regulator of, of mTOR. Now, uh, so, so we have RSK inhibiting um, tuberin and, and tuberin would be inhibiting REB, but it's no longer inhibiting REB because RSK is shutting it off. So now REB gets to activate mTOR. But then we also see some other interactions. We see RSK inhibiting what's called liver kinase B1. Don't think of it as a liver enzyme. This is a ubiquitous one, but um, RS kinase, it's phosphorylating stuff. So it's phosphorylating tuberin, right? It's phosphorylating glycogen synthase kinase three. We talked about that one. That one is turning on tuberin. So let's shut off this thing that's turning on tuberin. Let's shut off tuberin directly. Let's inhibit uh, LKB1, which would be turning on AMPK, 
right? This is the sort of like the primary way of turning on AMPK. You just need a bunch of AMP to do this, adenosine monophosphate to do it. This will all start clicking soon. I realize there's a lot of arrows and words coming all of a sudden. So AM, really yeah. Or no? mm -hmm. Can I ask a question real quickly or no? Yeah, go for it. Um, I was going to ask just kind of a general question, I guess, with mTOR, like hearing what you're saying about now and hooting, Reb, and all this stuff. And from watching, which we'll get into in the future with arginine and um, gator and all like the other inhibiting. Just we'll get into the gator complexes yeah. and stuff. Yeah, give us give us a couple days to get yeah, there. No, no, for sure. But I was going to ask, um, why, this might sound like kind of like a dumb question, but why does it seem like everything is trying to inhibit mTOR in the sense of like, is it just due to the fact that gaining muscle is technically inefficient in the sense of the human body to maintain so many calories like why is mTOR such a like you need to precisely you know activate everything just so you can stop the inhibiting of like other chemicals it's a really good so really good question yeah um super tightly regulated because otherwise you'll um anabolize yourself to death uh you know you just you create i mean it's just a matter of regulating uh, energy expense. And so my, my reference earlier to the government or even just balancing a checkbook, I, nobody is like checks are like unicorns, like nobody writes checks anymore. But, but the idea, we all know what the idea of balancing an account, you have income coming in and you have, you have expenses going out, your phone, your car, your rent, your food, your whatever's going out and your paycheck coming in and you have to balance these things. Protein synthesis, super expensive. ATP consumption, so expensive. I mean, it's like half the uh, metabolic price tag of the cell. So it's like rent, you know, rent is like half your paycheck and then everything else is sort of smaller expenses. You have uh, the cost of food, for, for me, that's really expensive, but, but you, you know, the cost of, of, you know, electricity and garbage and, and whatever utilities and, and, and the cost of entertainment and the cost of gas and the cost of what well, all of these expenses aren't that big compared to rent. You know, they think of protein translation like that, super expensive. And then once you build those proteins, you get this cell to be much bigger. And I mean, the rent is permanently elevated. And, 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 and so when, when you lose regulation of mTOR, death is surely going to follow. And think about things like appetites. You have a bunch of regulators of appetites, because if you just lose your appetite altogether, you sort of stop eating, at least the animal kingdom does. We know we have to force feed ourselves. You go to the hospital and people give you a feeding tube if necessary, you know, because we don't really respond to appetites, you know, in, in terms of like, oh, you're sick, oh, here, make sure you have your soup or, or make sure you get down your calories, whatever, you know, we're, we're conscious of, of, we're aware of the need for food, but animal, like a dog it loses appetite, it just like starves to death. And, and so there are multiple regulators of appetite. Um, you know, if you have nerve damage, you're still going to get hungry, you know, how you get like a, a war wound where, where the bullet goes like ripping through the vagus nerve or something, and you're still going to get hungry, you know, there's hormonal regulators, there's all sorts of regulators of appetite. And because it's, it's a problem, if you lose your appetite. Now, if, if mTOR signaling loses regulation, it's a problem. And you can, you can do uh, you can you can force this in in mice and, and rats and you know get some rodents in the lab and and you can you can mess with their regulation and they don't live that long um, this sort of runaway metabolism and it just ah, it's, it's it's so we need a lot of regulators because what if one thing goes wrong what if one thing knocks out your appetite and you're like oh, I guess I don't have an appetite anymore like species would stop existing like, globally I mean we'd have this like mass extinction because nothing felt like eating and if anabolism gets out of hand or catabolism gets out of hand you can anabolize or catabolize yourself to death and in either scenario that's what we're trying to avoid with all of this regulation so many umpires and and so you need and, and you may have seen some of this in videos or read in articles or something as you do your your sort of extracurricular ex exploration here you may see these different but necessary uh regulatory inputs from you know carbs and PI3K signaling and, and amino acids and those you know, RAG GTP aces and, and these different inputs. And, and when we get to the very end, remember I had those five things we're going to get through and we've already sort of covered like the first, you know, we're like number four, the first few are like, why does hypertrophy happen? You know, it's like, we answered that in a minute, but 
the we're in sort of the how hypertrophy happens uh, phase right now. And when we get to the last one, let's start combining things. Let's start combining Henneman size principle here. So, and that's when we're looking at these diverse inputs. Because while, you know, as I just said, anabolism, you can do it to death. Catabolism, you can do it to death. And if you lose regulation, you're going to do it in one direction or the other. But in the presence of regulation, you can tip the balance. And do you want to be catabolic? I'll show you how, right? Let's manipulate some of these variables we've been talking about all semester. Um, do you want to be anabolic? I will show you how. Let's manipulate some of these variables we've been talking about all semester. It's a tipping of the balance. And you're not eliminating mTOR signaling or, or sort of leaving the light on all night. You know, oh, let me just, you know, phosphorylate the lights and just leave the lights on all night and just ramp, just ramp up my energy bill. Like, that's not it. That's not how you do it, but but to favor anabolism through through mTOR signaling by tinkering with upstream inputs. I promise we'll do a lot of talk about that uh, with carbohydrates and and the types of amino acids that are valuable and and uh, mechanical loading characteristics and these different diverse inputs of how to turn on all the light switches in the house. So we'll, we'll I promise we'll go over that. It was a really good question. Thank a you. really good question is going to take time to to unfold and answer. So I haven't answered it yet, but I promise I will. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. So um, getting back to RSK, uh, it has a lot of functions. And so it's actually phosphorylating downstream ribosomal protein S6, right? That's a downstream target of mTOR. So there's mTOR signaling. And P70S6K downstream from that, you see ribosomal protein S6. Well, RSK, this is the same. So when you see these, these, uh, parallel roads to hypertrophy. You know, we talk about mTOR as the critical regulator. Yeah, but there's there's some parallel roads at the same time. Um, RSK also suppresses bad, remember, you know, BLC2, agonist of cell death, right? B, who cares? Agonist of death, right? So uh, RSK is inhibiting that. So while RSK is promoting hypertrophy through a bunch of pathways, so think MAPK signaling, um, part of that is through uh, Raptor, part of it is through Tuberin, this part is also through Tuberin, this part is also through Tuberin and um, through uh, Raptor. But so we, we have a bunch of Raptor and Tuberin interactions also um, inhibiting, you know, cell death and it's inhibiting and it's promoting downstream targets of, of mTOR. So, so we, we have some other busy kinases that are involved here. So this, this is, you see RSK, you, you recognize that one, ERK, right? Extracellular signal regulated kinase. So this is the MAPK. Um, signaling side over here. And you see mTOR PI3K and MAP path, path, MAPK pathways converge, right? So this is this, you know, the convergence of mTOR signaling over here. You see Tubrin, TSC2, inhibiting REB, and REB would be promoting mTOR activation, you know, rapamycin shutting it off over here. Um, so there's PI3K and you don't see PDK here, but there's, there's, some, there's some additional steps along the way. But so there's this convergence, but there's also crosstalk. These signaling cascades, MAPK and mTOR, they also communicate with each other as if by walkie talkie, right? You have CB system or something. You have like your radio frequencies. They communicate back and forth with at like halfway point. So there's crosstalk and a convergence. So these signaling cascades, um, they are both very anabolic. So if we think like MAPK, this is like prostaglandin signaling. And over here we have insulin signaling, but there's, there's overlap. Okay, so let's sum up Raptor. Regulatory associated protein of TOR, of target of rapamycin, um, Raptor. It's this, it's you know, potentially, Raptor may be responsible, bear some responsibility, not wholly responsible. Raptor may bear some responsibility for the assembly of the protein complex, right, of the complex here. Uh, remember, it's very abundant in your, in your skeletal muscle, and its primary function is to recruit the downstream targets of mTOR, the phosphorylation targets, P70S6K and 4EBP1, Raptor is recruiting those. Remember, Raptor has multiple phosphorylation sites. 
you can turn it on or you can turn it off. MAPK, you're turning it on. AMPK, you're turning it off. Um, and there, there are multiple uh, things that are going to interact with with Raptor um, through phosphorylation. Um, REB is promoting this, but really think of REB as, as your activator of mTOR, um, and then AMPK and MAPK. Get to know these two well. They look similar, and they are so, I mean, it's, the alphabet is the only thing they share. These things, I mean, these are like the opposite. AMPK, you know, I talk about a couple of enzymes as being your primary catabolic enzymes in the body. It's like PKA, you know, super catabolic enzyme. AMPK is probably the most catabolic. I don't know. You can argue PKA, whatever, but AMPK has, has easy to make argument for the most catabolic enzyme in the body. MAPK, this is one of your most anabolic enzymes. And so, you know, when people talk about like catabolic hormones and anabolic hormones, yeah, okay, yeah, it's not that interesting. Catabolic and anabolic enzymes is much more fascinating uh, than the hormones. And so, you know, like cortisol, catabolic, okay, fine. You know, testosterone, anabolic, you know, insulin, anabolic, okay, fine, whatever. But <clears throat> getting into these enzymes, you know, the protein, the, the signaling cascades, that's where it gets really fascinating and you can do a lot of interaction. Okay, let's move on to MLST8 or again, Gable. If you've seen or read Interview with the Vampire, that Anne Rice book, uh, the movie came out sort of in the peak of, it was uh, Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt and, and Antonio Banderas and all three of them were vampires. And Christian Slater was an interviewer. He was the one doing the interview. And it's sort of like a pre-Twilight except actually good, <laughs> uh, but better at least. Um, but this is a present in both Complex 1 and Complex 2. I love that movie. I, I do too. It's, it's uh, I just, I'm, I'm reading that, that comment box. It's actually, it's actually good and, and much better written than Twilight and much better, you know, acted than, than Twilight. But it's, it's, but it's sort of all the hit actors and, and it's, it's really not bad. Oh, and who was the little girl in it? Um, I, I keep wanting to say like Bernadette Peters. It's not her. She, uh, somebody, somebody will come up with it. Like the little girl vampire is also a huge, a huge name and her, like her hair grows back and stuff. Um, I have a little cliff I can play and you'll, you'll see who it is. But if this, if this helps you, if you know the movie Lestat, that's Tom Cruise's character is Lestat, Lestat de Lioncourt, Lestat. So M Lestat, M L S T eight, right? M Lestat. Is it cheesy? Yeah. I hope it's corny enough to remember though. Whatever is going to make you remember this, Kristen, uh, Kirsten Dunst, that's right. Um, so she's a little, so there's so many huge actors. It's actually a reasonable movie. So, but I, I hope every time you, you, you encounter this movie or book or to see it or see a clip or hear about it or something, you think of mTOR and you think of Lestat as a critical protein and mTOR signaling as, as MLST8. It's actually the least critical. It's the least interesting, the least studied, the least important, but it's Lestat. It's the Tom Cruise of mTOR, MLST8, M Lestat. And okay, let's watch a, a tiny clip. Oh wait, that, that wasn't the clip. A tiny clip that I can't play. Oh, there it is. Somehow. All right, so there's Brad Pitt. And there's Kirsten Dunst screaming like the Dickens because her hair just grew back. What have you done? I hate you. You made me a vampire. There's 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 MLST8. There's Gable. There's Gable in his wicker basket of a chair. Well, you get you get the idea. She like you know goes and cuts his face and the and he heals. So uh, this one it's it's again the least interesting it's the least studied and it seems what what mlst8 is doing it it seems to be required for some assembly think of it like the nebulin of mtor if you remember nebulin as the the ruler of actin right the yardstick of actin and sort of the assembly of actin okay Okay, MLST8, it's it's a cheap and inadequate description of, of Gable, but sure, think of it that way as, as the nebulin of mTOR. And there are some implications in cancer, right? If you have disrupted regulation, uh, Jacob's question earlier about why is this so tightly regulated? You know, you lose regulation and, and cancer is just, man, it takes over. And, and, and so, <clears throat> 
in in cases like cancer, maybe it's a target. Um, but like you knock out MLST, Gable or or Tom Cruise or MLST, whatever you want to call it, you you knock this thing out, and not that much changes. Right, it's not that much of a of a difference when when you do these these knockout conditions, and and you you'll see a slight, a very modest decrease in mTOR's phosphorylation of P70SXK. Okay, N knock out Tom Cruise and, and, and P70SSK gets phosphorylated a little bit less. Seems to be no change in 4EBP1, but there does seem to be roles in, in as a cancer, um, you know, to, to, to sort of a cancer prevention, um, you know, preventing metastases or growth of, of maybe there's some, some regulatory stuff there, but, you know, deletion of this and mTOR complex one sort of carries on, sort of carries on. So this seems to be kind of the least important of you know, within that complex, but it's, it's, a, it's a core protein in both complex one and complex two. Okay, let's get into some of these surrounding players. AMPK. You've seen this one before. You've seen AMPK, adenosine monophosphate, AMP, ATP, right? Isn't triphosphate? AMP. That's what this AMP stands for. Um, get rid of a couple of the phosphates and you have AMP. AMP activated protein kinase. This is a kinase. It phosphorylates stuff. It's a kinase. It attaches phosphates to things and it's activated really L LKB1, liver kinase B1, but, but you have to bind AMP to it. And I'm going to talk about that later. Um, we'll talk about, we'll have like a whole lecture on AMPK, critical, massively important uh, regulatory enzyme. People call it the metabolic master switch of deciding whether you're anabolic or catabolic. AMPK, massive at this. Now, PKB, AKT or, or, or PKB, this, I, I don't know if I mentioned this before. I probably did. It's, it's, a, it's a mouse he identifies a mouse with thymoma with thymus cancer. It's just like that's like the name of like the I mean, it's, it's a stupid name. Um, originally, names are, are going to be so mTOR is a stupid name. It sounds cool, mTOR. You know, it's like Thor and his hammer and whatever. But uh, target of rapamycin. What the hell are you talking about? Some like chemical from the island with those huge stone faces. That, that, that's what you're talking about. It's like some some bacterial. Uh, target of rapamycin. So that's sort of a super name. Um, so is AKT, but these, these sort of the original names of things stick. And so AKT is still in the literature. Maybe half the time you're going to see PKB, half the time you're going to see AKT. Get used to it. Know that AKT, you know, a mouse with like thymus cancer, you can look up the story. You know, I'm, I'm, my, my, I haven't read that story in a long time, so that I have an incomplete narrative of, of, of what the actual study was doing, but like that's essentially what it was doing. And, um, but this is PKB, protein kinase B, much better name, but you're going to see it both ways in all the diagrams, you're going to see it both ways in all the articles, you're going to see it both ways probably in like if you watch YouTube videos or something, you're going to see it both ways. Opposite effect. On, on tuberin, right, TSC2, tuberous sclerosis complex. So um, downstream, we're, we're inhibiting REB. You see a little GTP right here, guanine triphosphate, a little GTP. So what this is doing is facilitating the hydrolysis of the GTP. You need um, GTP bound REB to activate mTOR and let's hydrolyze it. So that's the regulation from tuberin. If you, if you deactivate tuberin, right, you deactivate the tuberous sclerosis complex, remember all this stuff, a bunch of complexes, you deactivate this, then um, REB, GTP bound REB is free to activate mTOR. If you promote tuberin, you're inhibiting REBTOR, uh, REBTOR, <laughs> that's actually a better name, <laughs> sort of. Nah, not really, um, but, but mTOR via, via REB. And you see FKBP12, uh, remember RAFT1 and FRAP, um, the F in RAFT to one and FRAP is FKBP12. That's where rapamycin um, interacts and, and mammalian target of rapamycin, rapamycin, right? This exogenous chemical, this big hunk of carbon. And mTOR complex one downstream, you see P70S6 kinase. Let's phosphorylate ribosomal protein S6. So P70S6K and, and ribosomal protein RPS6 protein synthesis. Let's grow. For EBP1, you phosphorylate this, shutting it off. 
And so this would be inhibiting protein synthesis and it no longer is. And here it's a little bit more detailed, right? This thing's a, 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 just a little bit more detailed. You know, again, um, tuberous sclerosis complex tuberous sclerosis is that condition of this of this unregulated um, uh, rapid out of control uh, tumor growth benign tumor growth and so we 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 need and if you have this mutated form it's just go mTOR go mTOR go mTOR right and um so what it's doing though is it's it's facilitating the hydrolysis of that of that gtp and uh, all you need to know here is the 4-EBP1, S6K1 or P70S6K and the ribosomal protein um, S6. And like stuff like this, like eukaryotic elongation factor two kinase, who cares? Yeah, I, this is what I care about. Right here to here to here, ribosomal protein S6, we're growing. Over here, um, if this is on, we're, we're inhibiting growth and we shut it off with this phosphorylation. Remember, Raptor recruits these downstream targets. mTOR is the kinase that phosphorylates them. Phosphorylates both of them, shutting this off and turning this one on. Deptor, uh, PRESS40, negative regulators of mTOR. And often you'll see these as sort of core proteins. Um, FKBB12 and rapamycin over here. Um, Deptor, you see this inhibition line. In all these, you see like inhibition lines. And uh, PRESS40, this inhibition line. There's MLSD8 or Gable. And you know, Raptor's recruiting downstream targets so that mTOR can phosphorylate them. It looks like mTOR is phosphorylate, or it looks like Raptor is phosphorylating stuff. It's not. It's recruiting them so that mTOR can do the phosphorylation. This is the kind kinase that does the phosphorylation. Um, but both of these, um, they're inhibitory proteins. And you just phosphorylate these things and you relieve their inhibition. You relieve the inhibition when you phosphorylate them. But Deptor is the fascinating one. Um, Deptor, it, we're, inhibiting, we're inhibiting the kinase activity of mTOR. Deptor is inhibiting the kinase activity of mTOR, the phosphorylating of mTOR. Um, but that's not, you know, that would create some problems, right? If you, in, if you inhibit mTOR, mTOR is preventing atrophy and, and apoptosis, you know, programmed cell death and, and autophagy, right? The self-dining um, autophagy, the sort of self-ingestion. Uh, so mTOR is stopping a lot of this this degradation. And Deptor, if it, if it inhibits mTOR, it's promoting, you know, autophagy and it's promoting apoptosis. And so Deptor has its own life. Deptor is like, you know what, I'm stopping you, but I'm also going to uh, inhibit, I'm going to halt apoptosis at the same time. So Deptor is fascinating. It sort of plays two lives. It's a gray character. You know, it's not just the all-out hero, right? It's not Hermione Granger that's just sort of hero beginning to end. It's uh, like a Snape or something, or like every single character in Game of Thrones. It's that gray space where they're one part hero, one part villain, um, except for Ned Stark. He's all hero. But sort of everyone else, we have some, we have some gray space. He's like a Lannister or something. And so that's what, that's what Deptor is. It's yeah, we're going to halt mTOR, but we're also going to halt um, apoptosis. And so the problems it creates, it also resolves. Now, the more mTOR signaling you have, it suppresses uh, Deptor uh, uh, expression. So mTOR is, is a little bit suppressive. Um, it's, it's oppressive to Deptor, let's say. You, you are going to, um, the more mTOR signaling you get, um, the less Deptor you, you, you wind up with, the less expression you're going to have. So sort of like sibling rivalries a little bit. You can think of mTOR and Deptor as these sort of sibling rivalries. But Deptor is a fascinating one because it is at the same time, um, let's turn on PKB and, and you know, let's get... Uh, proliferation going and let's halt apoptosis, but yeah, we're stopping you, mTOR. So there's a little bit of a sibling rivalry going on. And so mTOR regulation and, and autophagy, autophagy, you know, like a phagocytic cell dining, 
um, uh, and so press 40 indeptor characterized as negative regulators and sort of what they're doing a little bit, you know, preventing the um, mTOR, the kinase activity. Let's prevent mTOR from doing its function. And so where it's target of rapamycin, you know, up here is this, this, you know, bright orange font of rapamycin. That's what the R stands for in mTOR. So what the hell is this thing? Um, go to the, the Polynesian islands. There's like a thousand of these islands off the coast of Chile. And the most famous thing in these islands is probably these faces. Um, Easter Island, these, these giant faces. That's probably the, probably the most famous thing. The second most famous and far more important thing to come out of those islands rapamycin, which through which we've come to understand mTOR signaling. Um, and so the the language is Rapa Nui, and the name of the island in that language is Rapa Nui, so rapamycin uh, is like the most famous thing that's, that's again, come out of this. Um, and it's, again, it's just this exogenous chemical, huge hunk of carbon, and produced by bacteria discovered there your body, you don't have like, it's not coming out of the hypothalamus. It's like, well, my posterior pituitary is making it. That's not how it works. And, but that's the most important thing to come out of these, these islands other than life and, you know, humanity and whatever. Our understanding of, of mTOR signaling. Now, this is a glimpse at the, the you know, complex one and complex two, we're almost done for today. Um, we're just a little bit of work through complex one, complex two, and then I'll show you a big diagram and, and a big sloppy diagram that's actually very well regulated. But you know what Depter is. This is, this is the, it's gr even gray here. That's perfect. It's a gray character, right? It has pros and cons. And it's sort of all pro if you're going to talk about regulatory functions. And if you lose regulation, you die. From that perspective, it's all pro. But um, what what is what is the what is the guy from Game of Thrones, um, like the eunuch in the in the robe who gets you know destroyed by the dragon, um, whatever his name is, he's just like does everything for the country, uh, but he's like a morally gray character. I, I can't picture his name. I can see, I can see his face. Nobody's uh uh Game of Thrones. I, I'm not seeing any comments. All I can remember is the spider. I can't remember his actual name. That's right, the spider. Um, Viserys, is Varys or Viserys or something like that? Ver, Ver something. Um, what, Vis Varys, something like that. Um, so that's like everything is, you know, for country. You know, what, what are you doing this for? Well, you know, I'm doing it for Westeros. Um, and so, yeah, all pro, but but morally gray. That's Depter because it's it sort of knocks out mTOR, but okay, but let me stop um, the, the destruction over here. Um, press 40, sort of it's, it's, it's like the little sibling, this is boring, just this negative regulator. Now, what Jacob asked about, the, um, these the rags, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about those um, and sort of a, what we'll even come up with cliches like rags to riches <laughs> where I'm not gonna I, I hate cliches uh and then reb we, we know reb gtp right so we, we know all this stuff in complex one 40 bp1 p70 ssk those are the downstream targets raptor recruits them mTOR phosphorylates them so we're good with complex one now complex two depter m one and protor okay these are different and richter we talked about richter this this rapamycin insensitive now it's not wholly insensitive, and we'll, and we'll talk about that. Um, it's acutely insensitive, not chronically insensitive. You, you can knock this thing out, but um, you introduce rapamycin and you don't stop acutely. You do not stop mTOR complex two. You do acutely stop complex one, but there is a chronic effect if you if you continue to to uh, expose to to complex two rapamycin. But you know Richter and mTOR and MLSD8. You know what PKB is down here, and this is protein kinase C, but I talked about all those diverse effects of mTOR complex two. It's just a, the, the, it's so broad, it's so vast to these effects, everything from the liver to the, to the heart to, it's tons of ion transport, you know, getting into SGK, tons of ion transport. Um, you know, act inside a skeleton, stuff like that. And, you know, where the hell is our sodium going? And it's downstream targets, or the diagram, um, 
it doesn't so it doesn't show protein kinase C, but that's also one of them is, is PKC. And you don't really need to know these things to any degree of detail. Uh, SGK, um, uh, primary downstream target for for you know solute transport, you know, and so. I mean, there's a lot of like epithelial functioning and 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 uh, hydration regulation, ion regulation stuff. But uh, you know, M sign one, this is a recruiter of it, right? It doesn't seem to recruit PKB, but it does seem to recruit um, SGK. So this little guy is like a raptor recruiter uh, for downstream uh, targets. Also, um, this one, uh, Protor, seems to be. Um, uh, a recruiter to 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 be vitalish in the in the recruitment of in the in the phosphorylation of getting the mTOR enzyme to phosphorylase downstream targets. That's all I really care about complex two because it's not really muscle physiology other than this. This you're going to have to Lord Varus. Yeah, that's what it is. Um, in the comment box, uh, the, um, the the grayest character of all. And uh, so mTOR complex two. Right, you see Richter, mTOR, MLSD8 downstream. One of those targets, right? PKB, AKT, PKB, same thing. These are the exact same thing. mTOR, phosphorylase PKB. We know what's downstream from PKB. mTOR complex one, right? So we're we're going to inhibit tuberin, and that allows Reb to have its GTP, right? So what would be happening uh, with tuberin is we would be hydrolyzing the GTP. So Reb GDP, you need Reb GTP to activate mTOR, and um, so so downstream from complex two, we're activating a, a PKB and inhibiting. Uh, tuberin and allowing Reb to activate mTOR complex one. So there is a connection. Now this is it's super busy and it looks ridiculously busy, but you're going to start recognizing stuff. I mean, we're only going to go through eh, less than half. You see bad, right? B, blah, 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 agonist of death, apoptosis, right? Agonist of death. And so PKB, we're stopping that. Um, you see your PDK upstream from, from PKB. So technically we are, uh, as we go through, uh, PI3K is going to be on here somewhere. I don't, I don't know where the hell it is. You'll see PI3K on here somewhere. But uh, PI3K is converting uh, PIP2 to PIP3, right? And, and so it's up there. Um, so PI3K is converting PIP2 to PIP3. And this is actually a docking station, uh, uh, PIP3, so, so that PDK can activate uh, PKB. And then from PKB, we're, we're stopping uh, tuberin, which is stopping red from activating mTOR. You see 4EBP1 and P70SSK. Uh, you see PRAS40. Um, I talked about liver kinase B1, LKB1, ubiquitous. It doesn't have to be liver. Um, and there's AMPK. You see the insulin receptor, insulin receptor substrate. And, and so there's a lot of these things are are beginning to be recognized. So there's, you know, GLUT4 and the mobilization of GLUT4. And, and you know SGK, we talked about that, but but the, a lot of there, there's your PDE phosphodiesterase. There's a lot of these things. There's your MAPK, you know, signaling, and there's a lot of these things you're going to begin to to identify. And a kinase. Remember, this is a thing that attaches a phosphate to something. So just the kinases. You see all these kinases. They're attaching phosphates to things. A phosphatase is removing the phosphate. It's doing the opposite. It's undoing it. So uh, phosphatase and tensin uh, homolog, this, this uh, P10 up here, is doing the exact opposite as PI3K. So you have PIP2 being converted to PIP3. That is, <laughs> this slide scares me. You don't really need to know the whole slide. So don't don't let it be intimidating from like, oh shit, I have to learn all of this because you don't. But but there is a ton of stuff. There's um, glycogen synthase kinase 3, which is stopping glycogen synthase, which is promoting glycogen synthesis, right? And so um, so there's, there's a lot of these things you'd start to recognize, but you don't, you don't have to like recreate this because there's a lot of things we're just never going to talk about on here. I'll just, we'll never, I'm just like shit on here. I don't know what the hell it is. And, but a phosphatase, so like P10, this thing is converting PIP3 back into PIP2, right? So PIP, 
uh, three. So like if you have cancer, let's just get get this to start undoing PI3K's activity because super anabolic, right? Let's create a docking station where we can get uh, mTOR activated. And um, this is going to inhibit that. Imagine this is our pop quiz right now. Uh, now I do want, and this is, uh, this is, the type of information I'm going to want you to know, but it's, you don't have to know it today. The exam is a little ways away. And this is just the key, right? This is just explaining. It actually is a really good diagram, but it's just a key explaining what these arrows mean over there. Now, here's another look at just, let's look at some upstream and downstream and focus on PKB. You know, I said in an earlier lecture, I mean, it just looks hairy. I mean, literally like hair, like fur coming off of, it, of PKB. It's just like a fur ball with all these arrows. And but we see this is mTOR complex two right there. Um, you know, cytokine receptors, integrins, and focal adhesion kinase. So this is uh, mechanical signaling. And so we're going to talk about that stuff. Um, you see FOXO, forkhead boxo uh, down there. You see receptor tyrosine kinase. You're going to keep encountering this, and you don't need to know what it stands for. But um, but so there's just you're going to start encountering things that makes more sense. You know, there's Raptor and mTOR and Gable. So you know that's mTOR complex one. There's press four. Uh, there's your tuberin, um, and so you, there's bad, right? Um, and so you're going to start encountering a bunch more stuff. I, I realize we're out of time, so let me do this slide and one more slide. But um, uh, this is a walkthrough. Let me just narratively walk you through. So PI3K, that's like insulin signaling, right? PI3K, like it's activated by something, some some upstream uh, ligand binds to a cell surface receptor, and we activate PI3K. Now this converts PIP2 to PIP3 phosphatidyl and nosotol, bisphosphate to triphosphate. Again, who cared? Tri biphosphate, I don't care what you call it. Um, to triphosphate. So two phosphates to three phosphates, add a phosphate. It's kinase, right? This is a kinase, PI3 kinase. And so we, we, we're going to phosphorylate this. Now, PI3K, or P, uh, PIP3, rather, PIP3 docks PKB, and it's phosphorylated by PDK. So it's a combination of, of PIP3 and PDK is going to uh, get... Uh, PKB activated, right? So PKB is phosphorylated. PKB is activated. And PKB, as you saw, does tons of stuff. PKB automatic AV, right? Uh, in the comment box. Yeah, at this point, yeah. Well, we're, we'll do, well, I'll let you guys decide how the third exam is going to go. What the, the third quiz, not the third exam, uh, but the third quiz, because we're going to do one, uh, you know, a couple of days before the exam. I just want to make sure people are studying punctually uh, to be ready on time. And I'll let you guys sort of decide how that's going to go, and, and I will honor group consensus. It's not like everyone gets an A for nothing, because I want to make sure for 10 points that people are not like hold you accountable, but encourage. It's, it's to motivate learning so that you, you know, ace the exam. I just want everybody to ace this exam, but it is a lot of information. So um, PKB gets activated, and PKB is furry, right? Those arrows go everywhere. Now, tuberin is normally inhibiting REB. TSC complex, tuberous sclerosis complex, is normally inhibiting REB by hydrolyzing you know, the GTP by facilitating this hydrolysis of GTP. And you need GTP bound REB to, to activate mTOR. And so uh, you inhibit tuberin, you know, PKB inhibits tuberin. So now REB activates uh, mTOR. mTOR is going to phosphorylate its downstream targets. Like Raptor recruits its downstream targets, and mTOR, the kinase, phosphorylates them. And so P70SSK and 4EBP1. Now, downstream from P70SSK, we are, um, uh, we are, it's a kinase, we're phosphorylating ribosomal protein S6, right? So now we're translating. Um, a translational capacity, right? So we're translating those mRNAs. So translational capacity uh, increases. And then with 4-EBP1, when we phosphorylate that, we deactivate it. So we increase the rate of translation, the rate of translation. So um, that's efficiency. And so the result of this stuff is we're, we're making a bunch of protein. The result of this narrative is a ton of protein is being made. So the very brief summary is that different stuff affects mTOR. As Jacob said earlier, there's tons of regulation. Upstream regulation is just sort of outrageous. And a lot of stuff is going to affect the function of mTOR, whether it's it, you're in hypertrophy mode or atrophy mode. mTOR phosphorylates these two things. That increases 
uh, more total translation and more efficient uh, translation. So that's hypertrophy. Very last slide is this one. This is even more intimidating looking. Uh, but this is the author I keep referencing who has just such great papers um, is David Sabatini. And I, I think he has videos on YouTube, but his papers are wonderful. And if you can find his, his material. So this is one of his slides. And he says, mTOR signaling at a glance. Okay, as a glance, this is this is intense, right? But you're going to notice things, and you'll start. We'll start talking about these rags, right? So this is amino acid signaling, and so you see the the aminos down here. VPS uh, 34. This is a type of PI3K. We'll, we'll we'll talk about that. But there's glucose, um, some growth factors, you know, insulin, IGF, stuff like that. Insulin um, receptor substrate, PI3K, um, you know, PIP2 to PIP3. Um, you know, P10 is doing the opposite of, of PI3K. There's PDK that's turning on PKB. So now P, uh, PKB is going to inhibit tuberin. Um, let's, let's inhibit, you know, forkhead, boxo, fo the foxa. Uh, and let's get mTOR complex one signal. You see P70SSK and 4EBP1 down there. I'll talk a little bit about this stuff and the autophagy stuff later. Um, but, you know, there's, you know, tuberin and, and there you see is the REB. And, and so you, a lot of this stuff is starting to be more recognizable. Now, I don't need you to, to say like, oh, I can draw it from my head today. But to be that these words are starting to make a bunch of sense. It looks like a mess when you look at it, seemingly at a glance, like, that's a huge mess. But it's really elegant when you start looking at how the regulation works. And, you know, like my office, people will walk in there, it's like, what the hell? You have like piles of paper that are like a human being height and and there's just like shit everywhere. But yeah, but it's 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 organized to me. I know where all those papers are. This is my like integrin paper pile. This is my, you know, PI3K paper pile. And this, I mean like it's all organized to me. And this stuff has so much order, although it looks like a mess. It's like a messy, um, yeah, it's organized clutter in the in the comment box. And 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 that's really what it is, this organized clutter. And it's a balancing of budgets. It's so critical to balance those budgets, to know the income, to understand the financial resources that are upstream so you can program your downstream spending. And uh, the, the precise characteristics of nutrients, right? we have amino acids and, and carbohydrates and the precise nutritional characteristics Characteristics and how those are going to elicit differences, changes in uh, catabolism and anabolism of how you're going to regulate uh, those things. So let's stop there, a little bit over. But um, what are our questions for the day? If you were, okay, if we had like, let's say, mm -hmm, like an Olympic lifter. You see the power clean, like three sets of three, just full power. And then we have a bodybuilder, you know, getting a pump. Well, I mean, of course, he's going to gain size, so I'm probably activated differently. But I guess what I'm trying to ask is, I know diet, leucine, lysine, arginine, complete proteins are needed for the complete activation or optimization, I should say, of mTOR. But for these athletes who are more neural, these athletes who like like Olympic lifters who look very skinny and they're just, there's complete neural recruitment. Is mTOR different at all? Or is there like any differences we've seen in science thus far? Yeah, yeah the, the, the parameters of exercise really matter. And, and you, so we look at stuff like the, the characteristics of exercise that increase growth hormone. We talked about that, like be very lactate -y. I right, just have like tons of blood lactate and work out for a while, high volume. You know, you're getting more you know, testosterone too. And stuff. But, um, but the, the growth factors are going to respond to that type of exercise much better. And when we're looking at activation of mTOR hypertrophy, let's get more proteins, not just let's enhance rate coding and let's get you know GABA to fall asleep at the wheel and 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 um, you know all of these sort of neural responses that's that adapts really well in those uh, Olympic lifts 
but there isn't much centric loading, eccentric or eccentric loading. And I'm going to talk about what that does. I mean, you think about things like prostaglandins, you know, the, the eccentric loading, you're, you're going to get more damage, more, more prostaglandin release, and prostaglandins, MAPK signaling, and MAPK crosstalks with mTOR, but it also um, has its own sort of parallel uh, cascade that, that results in its own hypertrophy. And the, you know, IGF, I mean, so all of these upstream exercise decisions, right? These, these kind of programmatic decisions in, in how you're behaving in a, in a weight room matter for mTOR signaling. Um, you're not really going to grow doing, give some like power clean, like all concentric yeah. power cleans. So you just, you don't really grow from that. You'll get a ton of neuromuscular adaptation. I mean, like everything from the Golgi tendon organ. To, I, I mean, it's just like that response will be enormous, but the, uh, you asked a question a long time ago th that about, I think it was Dorian Gray. And it was sort of similar where I said, you know, the four different, I, I gave this down giant long answer where, where it's like, you know, the, the inputs, there's nutritional, there's um, hormonal, there's other chemical, right? So there's like, you know, prostaglandins. It depends if you count some of this stuff, like hormones or sort of cytokines and then, um, and, you know, if it's like interleukins 2 and 15, I mean, these, these, these other, uh, it depends if you count them hormones or not, but so other chemicals. So there's like, there's, you know, diet, there's, there's endocrine, um, there's mechanical loading, and then there's other chemical functions and, and the power cleans and stuff. Yeah, you get all that mechanical loading and then you can eat all you want, but you're missing the hormones, right? You're missing the cell signaling piece. And so that's, that's why people don't really grow very well when, when they're doing that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's kind of what I figured, but I just didn't know if like anything chemically would have been different. So thank you for that. And I guess last really quickly too, because I know people have other questions. I don't want to take up too much time, but if we were to get someone who like, I guess is a power lifter or, you know, Olympian, and we were like, you know what, we're gonna put you in a bodybuilding program due to their neural adaptation, due to all of that. Well, mTOR, I do, I guess, to just like their, you know, just like their mechanical advantages and stuff that they've had due to their prior history. Like one, one example could be Charles Glass with him doing gymnastics, I think at Stanford, if I recall. And then he became a bodybuilder in Singapore for a bit. I was just going to ask, like, if we were to do that with their mechanical advantages, what, due to like all their neuro recruitment and strength, would mTOR be any different for them since they're at a mechanical advantage already? Like, will mTOR just, I would say, will it shoot up? Because that sounds really dumb, but will there be any difference due to their mechanical predisposed advantage almost? Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. I don't quite know how to answer it, but I'm going to answer it from a perspective of they can produce an enormous amount of force given the cross-sectional area of the tissue. And that force generation, if they start controlling that in, in a way that, that elicits a a chemical response, I think they will have a bigger, they will, you know, the, the, the tissue is maybe not equipped to tolerate slow loads of heavy eccentric forces. And it is strong enough to produce those load profiles, but it is not reinforced enough to tolerate them. And I, I, I think even stuff like Mechano growth factor, just go nice, slow, eccentric reps, uh, and, and you're going to get a ton of MGF. And as, as that autocrine, you know, uh, autocrine, paracrine uh, response of, of IGF, that mechano growth factor, you're going to start seeing a lot more of that and, and more prostaglandins. And, and I think you would see an optimized chemical response owing to their increased work capacity at a smaller body, smaller cross-sectional area. I think that would happen. And also, I think, to succeed in something like that, gymnastics or power clean, the Olympic lifting or something, you probably have a very high percentage of type two fibers. I don't think there's a lot of Olympic lifters who are, you know, 85% type one, you know, I, they, they just, they aren't going to succeed that way. And so you have a muscle profile 
that was also sensitive to mTOR signaling. High growth ceiling, uh, mTOR signaling is much more um, active in, in the type two fiber compared to a type one. And, and so I think the answer to your question is yes. And there may be more to it than comes to my mind, at least, you know, at the moment, but does that kind of answer? No, no, it does. I just okay. didn't have like anything like scientific. No, that, that definitely answers it. I mean, that's kind of what I didn't clean on, which because it makes more sense. I mean, they're already at, I don't say an advantage, but you know, mechanically they know what to do. They know how to recruit their body better than most. And I was just kind of curious if there's any like literature or what your take was on that specifically. Yeah, no, I, I, th I think there is, room to grow faster i mean they're all right it's it's a i guess it's like if you're doing a drag strip you know there's two cars are going to do the quarter mile and once one car has already been driving for a quarter mile <laughs> they hit the starting line at the same time the one that's already going like 80 I, I, yeah they don't have to accelerate i mean they, they're already going. and so i think that's sort of the type of pacing that, that you would see is is they've been at it for a long time and they already have the neural adaptations and all they need to do is is alter some of the programmatic stresses some of the load profiles and 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 they'll see the chemical response to follow i just love cell cascades because it's just like more equations that i can sit there and manipulate and it's, it's... it is it is fascinating stuff and there are a ton of interactions and people will continue to identify more points of interaction you know behaviorally nutritionally supplementally um uh, pharmacologically and but once you have the map down, if somebody says, you know, just turn left to McDonald's, you, you know what that is. You, you, you know how to incorporate that. You know how to get there. And it's the same thing with mTOR. You memorize the map first, get that map down. And then once the map is down, you can figure out shortcuts. You can figure out um, the optimal route to take. You can sort of map quest your way G and MapQuest doesn't really exist. You can GPS your way to cell growth. You can GPS your way to cancer inhibition, right? If, if you want to ward off cancer, and you'll find some interesting things like where people say, like, let's talk about cancer for a second. And people say carbohydrates, go on a ketogenic diet because carbs are just feeding the cancer. Like that's sort of the slogan, right? That's the that is the cliche about as you know carbs feed the cancer yeah okay so the, the metabolism um is is a uh, you know um glycolysis i mean it's it, look at somebody's you know people will talk about lactate levels and fatigue and whatever and, and like oh, i woke up the next day and my lactate's still up like okay i go to the oncologist for that i mean if your blood lactate is like super high and this is not like you worked out yesterday and, and so there's a very glycolytic metabolism and do carbs feed it? Yeah, sure, there's a literal. There's also a figurative one. And when we start looking at things like AMPK and this uh, activation of AMPK um, through uh, depletion of, of carbohydrates and, and what AMPK is, is doing to a tumor. And, and, and so there's, it's more complicated than the surface cliches, feeding the cancer. Like, okay, let's just, let's not be crude in our understanding of physiology let's 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 go through some steps and, and sort of work out what's actually happening here and so this is where a lot of people struggle is like yeah the map is is too big of a deterrent right it's just you're standing at the base of the mountain looking up and seeing the just the cliffs of insanity and but like right on the side, right around like the other side of the mountain, there's this gradual slope, just sort of like learn a little bit every day. You know, I'm, I'm going to introduce more and more mTOR and, and add additional enzymes and interactions. And, and, and so if somebody just does the gradual slope and just sort of studies as they go, they get to the top of the cliffs. Um, but it's just, it's not as daunting to do the daily, but, but a lot of people look at the whole map, right? That, that last map, that is just like, man, that thing's super, a glance, a, a, like a, a quick glimpse at him or whatever it says. Like that thing looks intimidating. I mean, that is a daunting map, but just gradually learning that map. And then once you have it down, it's like, well, that wasn't hard at all. And at that point you can, you can figure out applications.
All right, should we get out of here? Jacob has already physically gotten out of there. But... Yeah, I have to go do some yard work. It's really windy and weird right now. The weather is definitely uh, fall. Yeah, sure. yeah, here too. I don't know where the hell you are. You might just be like down the street. Um, <laughs> so here too, it's like the same wind gust hits like your house. And then a second later, it blows my trees. My trees get all sassy in the backyard. You hear the same gunshots in Stockton. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I do. It's like, I, I don't think that's fireworks. <laughs> all right. I'll see you guys after the weekend.